This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. So, if you've been following this series, or indeed any media at all, you've come to the conclusion that there is nothing new under the sun and stories aren't so much told as retold. A man writes a book, it becomes a movie, then a few decades later another man combines both book and movie and perspective flips it to write another book, which becomes a musical, which becomes... two movies for reasons that don't seem to make sense? Never mind. The point is, a lot of musicals have a complicated lineage. For example, if you read the official billing text for Hello, Dolly, it says, based on the play The Matchmaker by Thornton Wilder, and that is what we'll be discussing today, but its roots are mangrove-like in both their depth and ability to branch in an extraordinary array of directions. To begin with, the 1954 romantic farce, considered one of Wilder's keystone works along with Our Town and The Skin of Our Teeth, was actually the second version of the script Wilder produced, the first being the 1938 flop The Merchant of Yonkers, and that was partially based on the 1842 German play, forgive my pronunciation, Einen Jux will er sich machen by Johann Nestroy, which in turn was an expansion of an 1835 English one-act called A Day Well Spent by John Oxenford. And that's just the overarching plot. Wilder also drew heavily on Moliere's The Miser for a scene in which Dolly Levi praises a prospective bride's domestic efficiency, and as for the leading lady herself, well, that's a whole separate conversation right there. So here's how it originally went down. Dry goods merchant and wealthiest curmudgeon in Yonkers, Horace Vandergelder, is having a busy day, berating his employees Cornelius Hackle and Barnaby Tucker, hiring slightly disreputable eternal apprentice Malachi Stack, sending his niece Ermengarde to New York City to prevent her from marrying artist Ambrose Kemper, before going there himself to propose marriage to widowed milliner Irene Malloy and thus engage some free domestic labor. Assisting him in these last two endeavors is his late wife's dearest friend, the multitasking Jill-of-all-trades Dolly Gallagher Levi. At least that's what Vandergelder thinks. In truth, Mrs. Levi is not only on Ermengarde and Ambrose's side, but is fully intent on marrying Vandergelder herself, the better to redistribute his hoarded wealth. She begins by obstructing Vandergelder's intentions with Mrs. Malloy by claiming she's found an even better match for him, the totally not made up Ernestina Simple, and offers to arrange a meeting over dinner. Meanwhile, Cornelius and Barnaby are fed up with the lack of work-life balance and sneak away to have a grand day in the city, and the hilarity proceeds to ensue. Cornelius and Barnaby try to dodge Vandergelder while falling for Mrs. Malloy and her apprentice, Minnie. Mrs. Levi tries to pass Cornelius off as a wealthy playboy. People hide behind screens and in cupboards and engage in a little light cross-dressing. And everyone has dinner at the Harmonia Gardens restaurant, where Vandergelder loses his purse, loses everyone's respect, and gets an epic nagging by Mrs. Levi as she shows him how his behavior has left him unhappy and alone. Eventually, the players all end up at the home of another of the late Mrs. Vandergelder's friends, the well-meaning but slow on the uptake Miss Van Hoysen, and after a bit more confusion, everything is straightened out, Cornelius proposes to Mrs. Malloy, and a chastened Vandergelder gives Ermengarde and Ambrose his blessing, makes Cornelius a partner, and proposes to Mrs. Levi. After a bit of token resistance, she accepts, and Barnaby, in the role of epilogue, wishes the audience the perfect mix of peace and adventure in their lives. There are some works that seem like unusual choices to turn into a musical. And then there are works like The Matchmaker, which are so obviously suited for the genre, it's a bit of a surprise they weren't written for it in the first place. Farce is a natural fit for musical comedy, with its ensembles of colorful characters, wacky shenanigans that make for good song and or dance sequences, and abundant complications that turn out all right in the end. In addition, Wilder's script includes several soliloquies that easily translate into focal numbers for the characters. Vandergelder's treatise on how matrimony is just a way to get your housekeeper emotionally invested in her job becomes It Takes a Woman, Cornelius's delight on meeting Mrs. Malloy becomes It Only Takes a Moment, and Mrs. Levi's desire to emerge from a life of lonely widowhood becomes Before the Parade Passes By. Trim the extraneous roles of Stack and Miss Van Hoysen, give your title character a little more of a star turn, and you have a great musical, headed by a leading lady who is, in every sense of the word, timeless. 
While on one hand the character of Dolly Levi is Wilder's own creation, on the other she is drawn from a very popular archetype, a servant, employee, or other subordinate who proves to be much cleverer than their theoretical superiors. This trope goes almost as far back as the beginnings of theater itself, when the comedies of Plautus often featured cunning slaves who used their wiles to assist or trick their masters. One such character, Pseudolus, would go on to inspire a musical in his own right. And it appears across time and culture, from the tricksters of indigenous and African traditions to Reynard the Fox, from Beaumarchais' Figaro to Wilder's Dolly Levi, from Sancho Panza to Jim Halpert and Guillermo de la Cruz. Because these characters speak to a universal truth, the chaos present even in the most seemingly rigid of structures. Throughout history, people who have had positions of privilege have liked to claim that privilege is justly bestowed, either by divine wisdom or by their own natural superiority or efforts. But even a brief glance at history proves that rank and merit have little to do with one another, and the consequences of hubris can be as comical as they can be tragic. That's why the plot and characters of the matchmaker remain resonant, even progressive. The famous line, money is like manure, it's not worth a thing unless it's spread about encouraging young things to grow, is practically a socialist manifesto. And as long as there are Horace Vandergelders thinking that 99% of the people in the world are fools and the rest of us are in danger of contamination, we need Dolly Levi's to remind them that they should probably round up that estimate.